Manchester that works for Manchester um, Community Dental. I've had the pleasure of being Helena Stone's dentist for the past few years and um, Kath and Colin have invited me to come and have a chat with you today about dental issues. They've pretty much given me a free reign, so I hope you find what I've got to say of interest. What I was hoping we could have a bit of a chat about today um, was I wanted to talk a little bit about oral health and general health. Because um, often oral health is taken out of the equation when general health is talked about. And they, they do interlink quite carefully. I also, when I did my literature research, um, I came across some articles that talked about um, tooth anomalies that are quite common with individuals that have costello. And then I wanted to just talk about um, preventing and prevention and how important that is. So, so the prevention of dental disease and what families can do at home and also what um, the dentists can do in the surgery. And then just a bit of a summarisation statement about why prevention is actually better um, when we're talking about dental issues. So, just moving on to the oral health and general health. As I just mentioned previously, um, oral health is very closely interlinked with general health. Um, if we have poor oral, poor oral health, it can affect how we eat, how we speak, how we smile, and uh, it has been known to affect confidence and self-esteem. Um, and interestingly, a lot of new developments have shown that um, people that do have poor oral health um, are also have greater risk of developing other general health issues. And on this slide, it's just to show um, the links that have been found. Um, so people that do have dental problems and oral, poor oral health are much more likely to have heart disease, strokes, mouth cancer, diabetes and some lung conditions. Um, the research in this area is still ongoing and they're still trying to get to the nitty gritty of the associations. Um, but one thought is that it's due to similar risk factors uh, being involved. And also, um, some issues, some, some general health problems can manifest orally. <clears throat> so for instance, um, for those individuals that are a little bit immunosuppressed, um, where their immune system is a bit low, um, you can get <clears throat> frequent oral infections and also um, for those that have feeding problems or nutritional deficiencies, they can show up in the mouth as ulcerations and um, sore tongues and altered taste. So just moving on. So the next part just to speak about was the anomalies that, ha that when I did done my research have been associated with Costello. So I found that um, anomalies occur in about two thirds, which is, which is quite high really, and they can affect teeth, they can affect the gums, and they can affect the jaw pattern. So when I am um, talking about affecting teeth, these four issues came up quite, quite frequently. Microdontia is just a fancy word for small teeth. Um, and the most frequently type of small teeth is conical shaped teeth. Hypodontia uh, refers to missing teeth and enamel hyperplasia uh, was occasionally reported. So the next slide just shows what they look like. So the first picture uh, shows the conical shaped tooth just here. Um, and this tooth is called the lateral incisor, so it's next door to the, the central incisor, the front tooth. And it's usually the most commonly tooth affected. Um, if, if a tooth is going to be missing or smaller, it, it's usually the one that, that is affected. So the first one shows the conical shape, um, and the slide beside, the picture beside um, shows the missing teeth. And then the two pictures at the bottom show this mild enamel hyperplasia. Well, sorry, the, the first one shows mild, the second one shows severely affected. So the enamel hyperplasia, what this is, it's to do with when the tooth is forming, and that will be while baby's still being, uh, being developed. 
um, and the enamel, which is the outer hard structure of the teeth, it just the bonds don't form strongly. Um, and in the mild effects, you can just get this opacity, this little discoloration, which is usually of no real concern. Um, but if it's severely affected, then you can get, as well as the colour problems, the aesthetic considerations, the teeth can be um, pitted, so um, it means they're harder to keep clean, and the enamel can crumble and break down quite considerably and quite quickly to, to cause dental decay. So, um, the main issue that I found with my research for Costello's and gum problems is this condition called gingival hypertrophy. And again, it can, it can range from being very mildly affected to very severely affected. And it's basically just where the gums um, overgrow. So they become, they become quite, the parents are quite swollen. Um, and they, they can uh, progress. And I've even seen, uh, not in a Castillo's child, but in another child, where they've completely covered the teeth. Um, it is closely related to oral hygiene, but medications can also um, contribute to this condition. And having listened to the first speaker, you mentioned epilepsy. There is epilepsy medication called cyclosporin, which is quite renowned for causing um, Cyclosporin nephedipi, which um, can cause this problem. Um, so it it doesn't generally tend to hurt. It's not painful, but it is unsightly. Okay, and then um, Costello's has been known to affect how the jaw grows. Um, as dentists, we call this malocclusion, the way that the teeth and the jaws come together. And there's just a couple of pictures there. Um, normally, the ideal occlusion, which is how the teeth come together, the front teeth bite <coughs> over the top of the bottom teeth. And so you can see in this first picture here, the, the lower jaw um, is the teeth on the lower jaw are biting over the, the, the top teeth. And on the other picture, we've got what we refer to as an anterior open bite. These can be quite difficult to manage. And obviously they, they need the help of orthodontists and sometimes um, oral surgeons to help manage those if, if intervention is, is wanted. And then other, so again, um, clenching and bruxism, which is teeth grinding came up frequently in the, um, in the literature when I was looking at Castillo's. And this is just an example of a severe um, case of tooth wear. Um, Again, it can be very hard to manage, um, and if the teeth are already slightly weaker from the, hyper, hyper, the enamel hyperplasia as mentioned before, tooth wear can happen quite quickly. It's usually, it is usually a slow process generally, but if the teeth are already weaker, then it, it can happen at a much faster rate. I have a question. Um, a lot of our kids throw up a lot, um, so does that must be an effect on yeah. their teeth from that. Absolutely. So, um, Acid, intrinsic acid, um, causes wear of teeth. Uh, we call it erosion, and it can affect. If, if it's if it's from an intrinsic source, it normally affects the, the underside of the upper teeth and um, and the uh, tops of the lower teeth. So that's where the acid kind of falls. So what can we do about it? It is, it is a difficult one. Obviously, if there's a medical cause, then it would be speak to your GPs to try to see whether the GPs can offer any, any medication to, to help prevent any of the reflux or anything like that. No? Um, from a dental point of view, what we, what we recommend is, um, first of all, I would, I, I would monitor that myself. So I would probably arrange, if it's possible, to take some models of the teeth so that I can just watch the pattern of where to see if it's happening fast or slow, um, and also just give general advice, so if, if there has been acid onto the teeth, the teeth are weaker for some time afterwards, mm -hmm. so it's actually really important that the teeth aren't brushed within the hour, because if you brush the teeth, you can, you, you're, you, the teeth are softer from the acid, and you can cause the tooth wear to happen at a much greater rate. We'd recommend just using a mouthwash <coughs> afterwards, or even having a drink of milk or some cheese because they're really good neutralizers. So um, with the vomiting, it's all about neutralizing the acid.
as, as quickly as you can. So the next part I wanted to talk about was the dental disease because these issues that I've mentioned previously, there's these are these just occur, then they they don't they're not preventable. Um, this condition may be preventable, depends upon the causative factor. Um, but tooth decay and gum problems um, affect all of us and um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about these two issues and why I think they are really important to consider for individuals with Costello. So tooth decay, for, for a tooth to decay four things have to be there. There has to be a tooth, there has to be sugar, there has to be bacteria and there has to be time for all these things to have their effect. And essentially, if we remove or disrupt any of those elements, then decay won't occur or it will occur at a much slower rate. So, going back to that first one, we could remove the tooth, extract the tooth. However, that's, as dentists, we try to avoid that, so I'm just going to take that out of the equation. So the next issue is controlling the dietary sugars and um, frequently disrupting the buildup of the bacteria on the tooth. So the sugar and the bacteria. So the dietary sugars. So just to mention that, all, not all dietary sugars are actually the same. So fresh fruit contains fructose, whereas the sugary sweeties and fizzy drinks usually have what's called sucrose added to them. Lactose is another natural sugar that's found in milk. Um, and from a dental point of view, it's the sucrose that tends to be more of the issue. Um, it's to do with the, 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 um, the framework of the sugar and how the bacteria is able to break it down. So what basically happens is the bacteria that's in the plaque reacts with the sugar that's been eaten and releases an acid. The acid then breaks down the tooth tissue and you get a cavity that's formed. And something that's actually really important is within our, within our mouths we have saliva and saliva is a natural buffer. It has lots of really good stuff in there. And one thing it does do, it helps to buffer the acid and bring the pH uh, back up to um, a more favorable level for, for teeth. So if individuals do have dry mouths, they are much, much more likely to develop decay because they've lost this buffering capacity or it's reduced. So as dentists, what we advise is we advise limiting sugary drinks and snacks to meal times only. So to try to um, keep snacks to breakfast, lunch, evening meal and try to have periods of non-sugar in between. Um, we advise advice to avoid dried fruit, although fresh fruit um, we, we do um, say is, is a very good snack to have. It does have the natural sugar in, but that sugar is not as, is not as worrisome as the sucrose sugar. But when a fruit is dried, um, the sugars become extremely concentrated and it also makes the fruit, so for example raisins, which is a dried fruit, the sugar is much more concentrated and the dried fruit is much stickier, so it tends to stick into all the little nooks and crannies and, and is able to stay on the tooth for a much longer time. Um, we advise to avoid any, any sugary snacks and drinks before bed and during the night, and this is because of um, the buffering capacity of the saliva. So during, when we go to bed, there's not as much saliva produced, um, and so any sugar that's still in the mouth at that time can, can stay in the mouth for a lot longer and have um, a much more um, untoward effect than we would want it to. We consider milk and water to be safe drinks. Um, however, we don't advise milk at night because milk has a small amount of natural sugar which could potentially cause a problem if given at night. This is from my experience of having space spoken to families. Um, so over time, so um, these foods actually do have, foods and drinks have quite high sugar content and often we don't realise it. Uh, tomato ketchup, <coughs> beans, it's the tomato sauce, it has, a, it has an awful lot of sugar added to it. 
Yogurts are also very high in sugar. Um, even the dietary yogurts are. And the no added sugar drinks, um, these are a little sneaky, I feel sometimes. Because you see the words no added sugar and it can make you think as a consumer that it's a healthy option. And it is healthier than other options. But it is important to understand that what they mean when they're talking about no added sugar drinks is that there will be sugar from usually the fruit that the drink has been made from. However, the manufacturers haven't added any further sugar on top of it. So they'll have less sugar, but they still have sugar. And if the drink, if, if the drink, the drink is, is, um, is consumed on a regular basis throughout the day, it still can cause dental decay. Flavoured water, again, sometimes as consumers uh, we see water, we think it's a healthy option. Some flavoured waters have extremely high sugar contents. Raisins I've spoken about before, and dried apricots and things like that all go into the same category. And milkshakes um, are very sugary also. So the next part is just uh, moving on to how, how we disrupt in the plant bacteria. So we've talked about the sugar and how the bacteria on the teeth use, um, use the sugar uh, to make the acids. So if we can remove the, the bacteria, if we can remove the plaque, we can disrupt that part of the cycle. So bacteria and sugar form a sticky layer which is called plaque and that sticks on the tooth. And what we want is, we want the plaque to be cleaned away thoroughly and efficiently twice daily with a brush and ideally a fluoride containing toothpaste. Um, just a little bit about brushes. So they can be manual um, or battery operated and there's loads and loads of different designs. And to be honest, it's whatever works in your hand. Um, some people really like the manual ones, some people prefer the electric toothbrush. They will both do the, the, the job efficiently um, if they're used correctly. Um, just a little slide here to show you about these brushes if, if, you might, if you're not aware of them you might not have seen them. These are manual brushes. Um, the first one is called a Dr. Barman and the second one is called a Collis Curve toothbrush. They're designed just slightly differently, as you can see. So the Dr. Barman has these three tufts that come up from the different directions. The Collis Curve, the tufts come out from the side and they join in the middle and they have a tuft in the middle. The idea behind them is that um, one stroke of the toothbrush is able to clean three surfaces all at once. And so it can, it, it can be useful if we're trying to um, maintain an individual's independence, perhaps if they haven't got the dexterity to brush thoroughly, it can help them to maintain independence, but it can also help for um, parents or carers that are, that are brushing um, individuals' teeth. Um, they're about, I think they're about five pounds each, um, but, and they come in different sizes as well. The top one has quite a small head, so that can, it's small but wide, uh, whereas the bottom one is shaped much more like a conventional toothbrush. Where would you get them from? In the UK, yeah. we get them from a company called Dentacare. Can you get um, them on Amazon? I think you can, yes. Yes. That's all I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and just not to forget about cleaning between teeth as well. So it's really, really important that we also try to clean in between the teeth because that's where a high proportion of decay does actually start. Um, these are called TP brushes and they're really easy to use and they're really quite nice to use rather than floss. Floss is fiddly. Um, it's difficult to do, it's difficult to get the angles. So basically with the TP brushes they come in a variety of sizes um, and you just grip it between your fingers and it's just a gentle push in and out between the teeth. Um, the other picture is what's called super floss. There's lots of different types of floss. Some are waxed, some are not, for ease of use. Super floss has this bit in the middle that kind of fluffs up. So you can put it in between the teeth, just release it gently, it'll fluff up and then pull it out. And it, it just helps to clean in between um, easily. <coughs> and then um, I cannot underestimate the, import the importance of a good brushing technique. Um, <coughs> Dental disease is, can, is caused by a combination of, of what we eat and drink, the sugar content, 
and not brushing um, effectively. So um, to control or, or prevent dental disease, we need to look at both of those elements. Um, and I've just mentioned before, the manual and electric toothbrushes. Um, interestingly, manual and electric toothbrushes should be, they're not used in the same way. So with a, with a manual brush, you need to um, brush all, the, all the, the four two surfaces separately. So you've got the, what, what we call the smiley bits, the bits that you see, the chewing bits, the bits that you chew on, the inside bits near the tongue, and then as the men, or, or the inside of your, the roof of your mouth, and then the in-between bits. So you have to do all of those in turn with a manual brush. With an electric toothbrush, um, you just hold it against the two. So a manual brush, you physically move your hand around and alter the angles. With the electric toothbrush, you let the toothbrush do the work for you. So you just position it and then hold it steady and then move to the next one. So it's used in a completely different manner. It's also really important that we also brush the gum margin, so where the tooth and the gum meet that edge. Um, it's not just about brushing teeth, it's brushing the, where the tooth and the gum join together. And it should take about two to three minutes. And there's, there's, dentists can give lots of advice and support about assisted brushing techniques if, if that is something that uh, would be useful to you. Um, for those of you that may help or assist um, individuals with brushing their teeth, um, one, one really useful piece of advice I would give is um, don't do it from them standing in front of you. So if you're trying to brush somebody's teeth and they're in front of you, it's, on, it's not the natural wrist action for yourself because you brush your teeth this way. So if you're doing it that way, it's a very hard thing to do. So get them sitting down with the head back or even better lying down and then uh, you're doing it from the natural position for yourself and it makes it easier for you to do also. What if you were to sit them in front of you, in front of a mirror, then it would be like your head, your head? What I would say is, it's for you. It's for you, vision really. So it depends on what you wanted to do. So if uh, having a mirror there is great because you can see, but if you're looking in the mirror, you're probably not going to be able to see inside the mouth to, the, to the, do the back areas. So um, if you're able to have them so that their head is positioned backwards, so either lying down or they've got the head resting against your shoulder, then you can uh, head resting maybe out here. You can see a little bit more <coughs> into the mouth, so you can you can make sure the toothbrush is getting to the back areas, to the areas that are often missed. Um, I think having a mirror is a very good idea because it helps the individual see what you're doing as well. So it's a combination of factors. And then just a little bit about toothpaste. So there's loads and loads of different types of toothpaste. As dentists, what we're concerned about really, what we're wanting is that um, for adults, um, we're using a, a toothpaste that's got uh, 1,450 parts per million fluoride. Every toothpaste on the back of it will have the ingredients and they'll have this number on. Um, so Manchester in particular, which has quite a high decay rate, we recommend this amount of fluoride for all individuals regardless of age. Um, in some other areas of the country, they say for children they're happy with um, a thousand parts per million fluoride or above. As I say, Manchester advise 1450. For a six-year-old, it's the size of a pea, so we don't want a big long line on the toothbrush, just a small amount the size of a pea. If the child's younger than that, just half it. So if a three-year-old, it's half the size of that. If they're, if they're even younger, just a smidge of toothpaste will be fine. And this is really important, this next bit. It's important to just spit or wipe any excess toothpaste after brushing and not rinse. So by rinsing, um, you're washing the toothpaste away. So after you've brushed, if you wipe or spit out the excess, some of the toothpaste will then stay on the teeth and it'll carry on working for much longer. So don't use a mouthwash straight after brushing teeth. If you want to use a mouthwash, we advise using it at a completely different time. So after work, after school, after college. Um, and that way as well, most mouthwashes do contain fluoride. Um, if, you're, if you did use the mouthwash straight after brushing, you're only getting the one hit of fluoride, but you may actually be decreasing that hit because you're washing the toothpaste away. Whereas if you're brushing morning and evening and then just wiping the ex excess and using a fluoride containing mouthwash, you're getting four hits of fluoride, uh, three hits of fluoride during the day. So, um, and 
There are even higher fluoride toothpaste that are available on prescription from dentists. Um, so the 5,000 parts per million is available for individuals over the age of 16. And we'll prescribe this for individuals that we see that, that we assess as having a high decay rate or for individuals where we really, really want to prevent uh, dental decay from occurring in the first place. And then the other toothpaste, the 2800, is for individuals over the age of 10. Okay. Other products that are available to help remove plaque and disrupt this plaque layer are chlorohexidine, and that's available in mouthwash gels and sprays. Ginger gel um, is another, another type of, um, of gel that can be used to, to brush away the plaque. Oral Nurse is a toothpaste that has um, the fluoride content. Um, Oral Nurse is an unflavoured toothpaste and it doesn't throp, throp up as well. So for individuals that don't like the mint, this is quite useful or don't like how the foam kind of overtakes them the mouth and fills up the mouth, that can be really useful. Um, I've used this myself and it is almost like brushing your teeth with water. It is, but for some, some individuals that's really, really useful and that's the only thing that they will use. Um, and then, as I said before, there are fluoride containing mouthwashes. <coughs> Just a little diagram of, of what they look like. So just moving on to the, the gum problems that can occur. So. When dentists are talking about gum problems, there's usually these two things. So we have gingivitis, which is um, just bleeding gums, and that's just because they're inflamed. And then we have periodontal disease, which we often call gum disease. And that's a little bit more than gingivitis. That's where the, um, the tissues around the teeth have started to break down, and that can include uh, the bone. So this, is, this just shows gingivitis. Um, it just shows just the, around the edges, the gum margins, you can see um, the, the red area and they look, they look a little bit angry looking, but there's been no breakdown um, of the surrounding areas of the tooth. Um, it's just localised to the edges of where the tooth and the gum join the margins. Gingivitis is really, really common and it can be prevented just by good thorough brushing um, using the paste, gels, uh, whatever, whatever it is you prefer. And interestingly, from my point of view, I often hear this. Um, so when, if an individual has um, gingivitis and I ask them about their brushing routine, I often get told that um, they don't brush often or don't brush for long or don't brush thoroughly because their gums bleed. And what's really important to get across is that the gums are bleeding because they're not being brushed. And it's almost like a vicious cycle, and to break that cycle, we have to brush them thoroughly. Uh, and if you do have gingivitis, um, usually brushing, good brushing has to occur for a week or so for the gingivitis to go, so the bleeding will continue for another good week or so uh, while the inflammation resolves. This is just to show some gum disease. Um, and you can see here just the breakdown of the bone and the gum that's occurred. So where gingivitis was just localised to the edges, this is a step further. And, it, and interestingly, or importantly, once, once it's been destroyed, it can't really be rebuilt. Gum disease can be stabilised. Um, over time, but it is quite difficult and it does require um, the dentist and the patient to, to both um, do, do, their, do their duties, so to speak. Um, gum disease, the problems that can come with it are the receding gums. Uh, the receding gums can make the teeth sensitive to cold things and sweet things. In severe cases, the teeth can become wobbly if a lot of bone has been destroyed and, and teeth can sell what we call self-exfoliate, which means they can fall out by themselves. You can get gum infections and halitosis. It can make the breath smell. Um, it's, it can be caused just by poor brushing alone, but there are other factors that interplay with gum disease as well. and Medical problems, medications, sometimes genetics 
and how it can all contribute to severity of gum disease and, and how it occurs and, and getting it under control as well. So I've kind of talked a little bit about what, what we can do at home, which is watching the, um, the drinks, the foods and the drinks, the sugary intake and then the brushing side of things. And that's something that's on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so when you visit the dentist, which might be every three months, four months, six months, 12 months, what can we do? So to prevent decay, um, the regular dental visits are really important because we can, we can help to detect it when it's early. So before a tooth, before a cavity forms, there can be subtle signs on the tooth that we refer to as demineralization. So it can just be a difference in the texture or the color. And at this point, if we can intervene, um, sometimes we can prevent a cavity being formed in the first place. And so uh, regular dental visits will help us to, um, to, to, to detect these early signs. We can place high uh, fluoride varnish, so as well as the high fluoride toothpaste that can be used daily, professionals uh, have a high fluoride varnish that can be applied. And this can be applied um, up to four times a year if needed, depending upon um, the risk status. So for an individual with a high decay risk, we'd, we'd apply it every four times. An individual that's got a low, it might only be twice a year, once a year. And then we can place what's called fissure sealants, and this is a fissure sealant. So on the back molar teeth, usually, we have the grooves on the biting surface. And quite frequently, this is usually in childhood, this is where decay starts um, and so what we can do is um, we can quite easily and simply place a little coating that fills in the grooves and that's what the other picture is um, and it makes the surface instead of it being <coughs> rough and a bit sticky um, it makes it smooth and more <coughs> cleansable it's such a simple thing to do it takes two minutes doesn't involve any numbing or drilling um, and they've been shown to really work well. And I've seen some placed, you know, that have lasted 40 years. They do last quite a long time. They, uh, they sometimes need to be topped up from time to time. Um, but we can do those. Um, ideally, this, these are done before any decay is started. So which is why it's important for, for children to come and visit the dentist from an early age. So as soon as these teeth come through, we can assess to see whether these coatings would be of value. Um, we can also pre uh, put preventative sealants, and it's very similar to this, but preventative sealants are usually when decay might have just started. So it's in maybe the outer shell of the tooth. Um, sometimes we'll need to make a, a small cavity um, sometimes we can put a coating straight on over the top and the idea is that we're sealing the tooth off um, and, um, and that can work well in very early cases of decay. Uh, we can also take x-rays uh, to detect early decay. Um, for individuals that have got a high decay rate in the, in the UK, uh, we recommend x-rays every six months. Um, for, for those that have got a moderate, it's 12 months. For those that have got a, a low risk, it can be up to two every two years. We can just offer su support and advice as well, and sometimes just having that communication between the families and the dentist is really important to just, just you know, so we can praise what you're doing and tell you're doing the right thing, or, or perhaps we, can, we might have some ideas of, to help you in areas where you may be struggling. And we can prescribe the high fluoride toothpaste where needed. And then what can dentists do about the gum disease? Well, every time, for, for usually um, children, we don't screen um, up until about the age of eight. And then for eight-year-olds, there's a modified screening method that we can use. And then from adulthood, which is usually 16 plus, we do a full screen of all the gums. It's because obviously um, in adolescence, we've got a mixture of baby teeth and adult teeth, which is why we use a modified version. Um, so. <laughs> We, can, we screen the gums for disease at every checkup, and we can remove the plaque and the calculus as needed. Um, calculus is basically plaque that has calcified. So if plaque isn't removed from the teeth um, over time, it, um, it, it calcifies and becomes as hard as stone, and it can't be removed by brushing. And so um, that's when dentists are needed to remove that. Um, 
we can do any deep cleaning. <clears throat> if there are signs of gum disease and deep cleaning um, you know, is, is warranted, then we can do that. We can monitor the gum disease so we can assess whether it's happening slowly or if it's fast. Um, again, we can advise and support and we can refer to specialists if needed to help manage the gum problems. And so, going just, just to summarise on what I've said so far, why is prevention so important? So, preventing dental disease, preventing dental <coughs> problems is always going to be better than trying to cure it. It's, it's better for any individual. Um, and dental decay is actually 100% preventable. It is, it, is a, it is a preventable disease. Um, anxiety is a very, we see anxiety very, very commonly in the dental surgery and it can make treatment quite challenging. And so if we can prevent problems in the first place, we can hopefully make coming to the dentist um, a little bit more of a pleasant experience, we hope. Um, and as mentioned at the beginning, um, poor oral health is linked to general health problems. Um, and so if we can manage our oral health and, and get that as good as we can, hopefully that will help protect us or help us with our other general health problems. And um, existing health conditions um, do actually impact on how dentists manage problems. I'll just talk about that on the next slide in a moment. And, and as with any medical procedure, every treatment that we do does have risks. So if we, if we prevent and we don't have to do the procedure in the first place, that's going to be far better for all. <coughs> and then just a couple of specific things um, for Costello patients and dental treatment. So I know some of these were mentioned previously. Um, so Costello individuals tend to have quite flexible joints. And... Um, for dental treatment, this could be um, relevant because the actual jaw joint, um, if somebody has to keep the mouth open for some time, that could affect the jaw joint. And um, for other individuals that have had, that have got hypermobility, um, there has been cases, I haven't seen it for the stillos, but for other individuals, where the jaw has actually dislocated or moved out of place if it's been kept, they've had to keep the mouth open for considerable amounts of time. So, um, I think it'd be important if, we're, if dentists are looking after an individual with costellos just to make sure that frequent breaks are there to let the jaw have a rest. There are props that dentists can use that can help support the jaw as well. Um, weak muscle tone, hypotonia um, has also been associated with costello individuals. Um, and this, this could affect how an individual perhaps is able to grip a toothbrush and the dexterity of, of moving the toothbrush around the mouth. But it also could affect um, the muscles in the face. Uh, the tongue is actually, uh, the tongue is, is a muscle and um, swallowing um, is an action of several muscles as well. So um, it's, that's important to consider. And then I think the main issue dentists probably need to consider if they're looking after an individual Costello is the heart problems. As mentioned previously, a lot of Costello individuals have arrhythmias um, and arrhythmias can be, um, so for an individual that is, is anxious, that can, that can have an impact on an individual with, with an arrhythmia. Yeah. Um, so if we can reduce the dental anxiety, prevent them having to have a procedure that makes them a little anxious, that's a good thing all around. But also, if they need to have local anaesthetic, in the UK, the main types of local anaesthetic we use have adrenaline in there. And uh, the manufacturers of the local anaesthetics do, um, do have to ask dentists to use caution with the use of those. Um, so again, um, if, if an individual needs to have a filling and we need to use a, <coughs> a numbing solution, dentists are going to need to have to think carefully about what type of numbing solution to use um, from <coughs> the vast variety of, of, of local anaesthetics available. And then the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, I was actually speaking with Kath about this not so long ago. Um, in the UK, we're governed by guidelines and <coughs> one, of the one of the people that form these guidelines um, is NICE. I'm sure everybody's heard about NICE. And so um, there are a group of individuals um, that if they have certain cardiac problems, 
Um, they, they are at an increased risk of developing a condition that's called infective endocarditis um, during, after they've had dental treatment. Um, the NICE guidelines are freely available on the internet and they do some really good, um, really good um, booklets for parents, uh, individuals and for clinicians. So have a look if, if you wish. And basically what, what this is referring to, so if a dental procedure is likely to make somebody bleed, so that would be if you're doing a cleaning, if you're doing some gum work, if you're taking a tooth out, um, bacteria can and do enter the bloodstream and for normal healthy people usually not an issue at all. Um, for an individual that has a cardiac issue of which um, stenosis, which was mentioned before, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, the bacteria can, can sit on the heart and cause what we call vegetations and, um, and you can get this very, very unpleasant and can be fatal <coughs> disorder called infective endocarditis. So, um, when I qualified many years ago, we used to give what's called antibiotic cover for all individuals that may be going, undergoing a dental procedure that were at risk of infective endocarditis. Then, not so long ago, the guidelines changed in the UK and said nobody has it anymore. And now they've recently revised them again and said that um, there are certain individuals. So they've, they've classified individuals with heart conditions of, of having an increased risk. And then there's a subgroup where they are at very high risk. So the current um, guidelines say for those at, at an increased risk, we have to warn individuals and parents if we're doing an invasive dental procedure like an extraction that, that infective endocarditis could occur. It's a very low risk um, and, um, and kind of give them the relevant information. Uh, but we don't give them antibiotic cover for those that, that are just classed as being at increased risk. For those in the special subgroup that are at a very high risk, then the guidelines state that um, we liaise with cardiologists. And for most of the individuals with costeros, that's what I would imagine the dentist would be doing. Um, and, um, to, to, and, and that would mean that any procedure that's invasive, the individual would need an anti antibiotic taken one hour before the dental procedure. To, so that any bacteria that is released into the bloodstream um, is, is the antibiotic um, prevents it from having, uh, from causing a problem. So that's that's me done. I hope it's been of use to you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm remembering at least one adult with Costello syndrome that had the overgrowth of the gums and had them cut back. Yes. So that's, that's the therapy for me. Yes. It, well, sometimes it can be, because it can be caused by many things. So if it's, just, if it's caused because the oral hygiene isn't, isn't at a good standard, sometimes cleaning and use of Corsidol alone can help it resolve. But it doesn't, it doesn't resolve quickly. It can take months. It can take months to get better. Um, if it is very overgrown, then yes, sometimes surgery, laser surgery is needed. Um, that would usually be done in a hospital environment. And if, if the individual does have a, a heart issue, obviously that would be classed as an invasive procedure. So they'd have to be considered whether this antibiotic cover would, would be required for that. Yes, this, this was the... Uh child of a dental hygienist who knew about all that yes. and did have a heart issue. Right. So that makes sense. It can also be caused by medications alone though. Yes. Uh, we, we, wanted, we wanted you to see uh, our son. Uh, but, um, I was. I wanted also to know what do you think about this uh, high pressure uh, tooth uh, washer? I don't know if they are. High pressure tooth washer. The, the, the water, 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 water. Yeah. Yeah. No. They, they, 
they seem to have had quite good results. Um, some people don't like the sensation. Um, so um, if that's for cleaning kind of in between teeth. Um, yes, no, um, I think, I think they've, the, the research is quite good on those. And um, I think if you can use it well and, uh, and, you know, it's, and it's working well for you and your family, then absolutely, yeah. I think that's a good idea. Have you got any other questions? It's a lady here. Oh, behind me. Behind me, it's just Halloween. <laughs> Do you have any advice for Bruxists? For Bruxists? Yeah. <laughs> Bruxists grinding at night. Yeah. Yeah, it's. it's yes. Well, they told me they, she had headache. Uh, yes. Bruxes. Yes. It is very, very difficult, and the problem with Bruxism, which is grinding, is that it's usually done at night. And so in the daytime, you can keep an eye on the child or the adult and, and kind of just nudge them to, to, to just mention that they're doing it and it can be stopped that way. Um, in a child, it's extremely difficult to manage. Um, there are bite guards that, some, that can be made, usually a little bit of an older age range though. Um, because um, with a bite guard, it fits quite closely around the teeth. Uh, with children's teeth obviously are falling out to developing new adult ones, so they will, um, the bite guard will often not fit very well. Um, and we also need to make sure that with a bite guard it's not going to become, it's because it's worn at night, it needs to, we need to make sure it's not going to be any kind of choking hazard. So for little ones where the bite guard is likely to be small, um, I, I probably wouldn't uh, want to make one for a very young child just in case it does come dislodged. Yes. Yeah. Somewhat, sorry. They are giving her something to relax. To relax, yes, yes. To, to relax the muscles. No, um, in my, cause I look after my my kind of job is um, I look after lots of children um, with all different types of conditions, and I do see um, grinding quite a lot in the general public. And interestingly, though, as the adult teeth come through, it, it does tend to lessen and stop. So. Maybe, hopefully, that, that might help. Um, but as I say, with, when I've looked at particularly Costillos, um, clenching and grinding has been a feature in adulthood. But as an individual gets older, these bite guards may be something that can be provided. Do you see any children with CFC syndrome? I don't. I, I see children with Noonans. But uh, no. Any uh, with the Noonan? Then is there anything? So we have some CFC that could be on the border with Noonan. Is there any <coughs> commonality? Of they, well, having listened to the ladies' presentation this morning, um, yes, I've been quite enlightened on some of the on some of the features there. And uh, when I kind of, because because I um, only when I've done my recent research have I have I have I know have I realised that that there is a link. Uh, prior to that, I wasn't aware there was, and so um, and, and so now that I, I've listened to. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Sorry, that goes along with that. Your community-based dentist. I am. Yes. Quite a lot of our kids with severe behavioural differences and, and proper sort of bad autism and things end up under the hospital dental service. And my guess is that most of our local CFC gang might be overrepresented in the hospital dental um, service. So, when did, did Kay come and talk? Kay Good. Yeah. A few years ago. Yeah. Um, I think she'd got more of a hospital based perspective, and perhaps that was where some of the people with more of an ASD, sensory defensiveness, won't open their mouth for level money type patients were being seen as opposed to the, the relatively well behaved guys yes. that you get. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. because he waits so much in the night, which is also a part of um, CFC. But, I mean, how much of a problem is that for his teeth? 
it can it can cause problems because it's almost like um, with the door, it's almost like self orthodontics because um, all, all orthodontics is is applying pressure to teeth to make them move and if you have a dummy that's there for a considerable length of time it can cause the upper teeth to procline and the lower teeth to retrocline and it can cause what we call an anterior open mouth which is where you get um, an opening at the front and the teeth can sometimes have a step in them um, and that and it perfectly matches the, the shape of the dummy. Um, it is a difficult one and unfortunately what they've, with orthodontics to correct it, if the dummy habit's still happening, it, um, it, it, it will relapse, it won't, it won't happen. Um, mm, it's a, it is very difficult and, and we, I mean, we advise to try to stop any dummy habits um, from about the age of three years on because the effects happen in the baby teeth but if it stops <coughs> early enough it's usually not carried on to the adult teeth. Um, yeah, I, hope, I hope that's of some, yeah. some use to you. <laughs> yeah. More questions? We've got time for one more question. We have to finish at 11. We can no, talk to Kelly during break. Two more questions. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Um, just a quick question about the dental treatment of um, uh, when kids have like wobbly teeth. Okay. Um, so Henry is four and he's got his teeth, but he's got an oral aversion and also swallow. Um, what happens when the teeth get wobbly and then fall out? Like, I'm worried that he's going to swallow it or it's, it's going to happen. I just wondered if there was any dental management around that. No, to, to, to answer. If we feel there's an aspiration risk, then sometimes uh, we will take out baby teeth. But there's, there's 20 baby teeth, and to take out, and obviously they all get wobbly at different times. And so uh, for, some, for some children, to take out teeth is quite, a, um, quite an unpleasant experience. And so it's weighing up the pros and the cons of each procedure. Ideally, um, shedding teeth, exfoliation, is a natural process. And we try to, as dentists, we try to just encourage that natural exfoliation, if at all possible. Um, there are some children that do swallow teeth, and um, they usually pass through the system without any untoward effects. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> um, most of the time, they'll, they'll kind of, you know, they will just kind of spit them out. Um, but I, I think the main issue really is if you really felt there was an aspiration risk. He has that risk. He has an yeah. aspiration swallow and other bits and bobs. So. Yeah. Does he have? Does, does he see a dentist? Yeah, we've got yeah. a specialist one at the hospital. Great. Yes. Yeah. So I'm sure I'm sure they'll be taking that into consideration. But I, you know, ideally, we try. We, we want them to to be shed naturally. Thank you. You're welcome. I always thought the ones that passed through the systems were as rare as civet coffee <laughs> and worth a lot more for the tooth fairy. <laughs> Last question. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood right. My daughter is going, I don't know what it's English, but when she's sleeping at the hospital, they're going to look at her teeth because they're not allowed to look at them otherwise. Okay. And she has a heart defect. She's not Costello. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you said. She should have antibiotics before surgery. So. No, no, not all, not all children. It depends upon the heart condition. Mm -hmm. So there are some heart conditions that um, that are of no no relevance whatsoever. Um, there are some which have an increased risk of developing a problem, and then there are some which are considered high risk. Um, and is your sorry, is it your daughter your son? She has actually shock too. Okay. So she, does she have a cardiologist? Yes. Yes. It would probably be the cardiologist that makes that ultimate decision. Oh. Okay. So if, she, if she's having the work done in the hospital, um, I imagine the cardiologist will, will be aware of that. They're supposed to talk to you. Yes. I, I imagine so. I imagine so. so but there's, there would be no harm in you raising, <coughs> raising that question if you wish. Um, but um, yes, it, it depends upon what exactly the heart condition is. And, um, and sometimes the views of the cardiologist as well. Okay. Thank you. I've got a question for a lot of our younger children have do very rhythmic tongue movements with that as well. Is there any particular effect or worry about or? 
Not necessarily. Some some individuals that kind of have tongue thrusting and kind of push it out, they can also have have like an orthodontic side of things. So if the, the if the thrust is quite a forceful thrust and it happens quite a lot of the time, that can be enough to move teeth. I mean, it's very very slowly, very very gradually. It's probably not something you'll, you'd notice, but um, you, you can sometimes cause the teeth to, to move outwards a little. Right, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Questions can be taken over the coffee break as well.